Richard Roberts here to introduce you to the first comedian who became a star of Wise Brother Comedies, Snub Pollard, well-known comedian, I'm sure the name is familiar, and uh, after being a comedian for Hal Roach for a number of years, he self-produced this series, the first of two that he would make for the Weiss Brothers, and it's got a good comedy cast here who we'll be discussing, and uh, a lot of well-known comedy names, at least to comedy historians, but we'll, uh, we'll get those uh, introduced and explained to you as well. So these were slightly higher budgeted comedies than your average Weiss brother picture. These, because Snub was producing these himself, they were in the seven to eight thousand dollar range, which again may have been part of the problem when he started to have financial problems later on. Here's Max Asher, a good old veteran silent film comic, even at this point, shooing the people in the uh, elevator there. And here's Snub making his introduction. You'll see him behind the catcher's mask. There he is with the trademark Kaiser Wilhelm mustache. The fellow on the right is Robert O'Connor, who was a Roach supporting comedian in the early 20s. He worked with Snub and Harold Lloyd and Eddie Boland and Paul Parrott and many of the Roach comedians from that period. Also uh, worked as uh, usually playing a villain, a lot of B-Westerns, that sort of thing, through the 20s. Um, Robert O'Connor, I believe, uh, spoke fluent Spanish. I'm not sure whether he was of Hispanic descent or not. I'm not sure Robert O'Connor was his real name, but in the early 30s he was working as Hal Roach as an interpreter and translator on the foreign language versions of the comedies that they were producing, where comics like Laurel and Hardy were speaking Spanish phonetically, and he was working as, like I said, translating the uh, American dialogue into Spanish. Worked, you, you see him a lot even in, in a lot of B films in the 30s. Again, usually playing gangsters or villains or some sort of thing. Now, Max Asher, again, his career goes way, way back. He was uh, one of the early silent film comedy stars. Uh, got into films working for Max Sennett at Keystone in 1912, right at the beginning of Keystone, straight out of vaudeville. He'd worked in California West Coast vaudeville for a number of years before getting into pictures. Worked at Senate for a couple of months, then found himself stolen away by Universal, where first they put him in the uh, Powers comedies. It's about 1913. Very soon moved him to the Joker comedies, which was a new comedy brand sort of taking on Keystone in competition in 1913. Max Asher was a very versatile comic actor, played a number of characters, specialized in what they called sort of the Dutch comic that kind of disappeared after World War I, but was, again, the mainstay of the Joker comedies through 1914, was part of a very early comedy team, teamed with Harry McCoy, and uh, they played characters called Mike and Jake in the Joker comedies in that period. I think, uh, I think Asher was Mike and McCoy was Jake, but then McCoy was replaced by Bobby Vernon, who was later a big comedy star with Al Christie, uh, who made his debut also at, at Powers, or I mean Joker, I'm sorry. Joker had a, a number of comedians working uh, for them around this time, including Gail Henry, Billy Franey, uh, Milburn Moranti, and I think Max Asher started to feel a little crowded since he had been the original star comic, so he left Joker about October 1914, went to work for Fred Balshoffer's Sterling Comedies, which was another universal brand that starred uh, former Senate comedian Ford Sterling, who left Senate along with the notorious Henry Lehrman, who was a director at Senate and later a producer of the uh, LKO comedies, the Sunshine comedies, many, many more. Oh, now there's Gene Hope, who's uh, the blonde. Now, she was married to Eddie Boland, who was another Hal Roach comedian who's working here with Snubbo. And the gossip there is Patsy O'Byrne again. Uh, we saw her in um, She Said No with Ben Turpin. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of Roach people. Snub's obviously hiring uh, people he's used to working with. The cinematographer, 
cameraman, I guess cinematographer's too big a word for comedies, is Robert Doran, who was one of Hal Roach's cameramen uh, going all the way back, almost the beginning of the Roland Company. He had uh, shot Harold Lloyd comedies, the early Stan Laurel solo comedies. He'd worked with Toto, Snub Pollard, uh, shot the, the Will Rogers comedies for Roach. So, again, it's probably somebody Snub was very used to working with. And uh, anyway, getting back to Asher, he worked for Sterling for, well, basically till Sterling comedies disbanded, which was the end of 1914, and went back to uh, the Powers Company. He basically was just working through all these different companies releasing through Universal, but Powers starred him in this really fun spoof of serials. It was ser sort of a serial itself called Lady Baffles and Detective Duck, in which he played Detective Duck. I mean, they're already spoofing the serial cliches in 1915. You know, serial's only been around about three years at that point. They were already cliched. After those, which were very successful, uh, Universal starred him in his own comedy series, but that only lasted about a year. In 1916, Asher finally had enough of Universal, and he went back to the stage first around 1916, but a year later was back at Vitagraph, supporting the comedy team of Earl Montgomery and Joe Rock, who were very popular at the time, sort of stunt comedians. He worked with them for the next two or three years until they disbanded as a team. And then Joe Rock actually became an independent uh, comedy producer, and Max Asher was working for him as a supporting comic for a number of years in the early 20s. By that time, Asher was branching out, working as supporting comic in feature films. He was working in Al Roach, supporting comics like Charlie Chase, Wallace Beery, Raymond Hatton, Monty Banks. He's in Monty Banks' Play Safe. Just worked very steadily and continued working for the Weiss Brothers. You're going to see him pop up in uh, some of the Hairbreath Harrys. He, again, works very, very steadily. But because also he was such a, a chameleon, I mean, his, you know, he would play anything, you know, villains, he would play like the father of the leading lady like he is here, all sorts of things. But this was basically due to his virtuosity as a makeup man. And he began to do a lot of that behind the camera. A lot of, first working for some of the B studios, then he became a makeup man at Universal. And I think at Paramount worked for them in that capacity through the 30s and 40s. Kind of gave up acting, you know, started, started to cut down his acting work in the 30s. Retired, I think, from the motion picture business sometime in the, in the 40s, opened a magic store out on Ocean Park Pier in Venice, California. He ran that until his death in 1957. Oh, here's Les Bates. Now, Les Bates, uh, who's playing Gene Hope's husband, another character actor, actually worked more in westerns, worked in a number of Weiss Brother things, did, did, did the occasional comedies like this. He's in some of the Billy West uh, Cumberland comedies that were produced for Arrow. Um, you see him in, in a number of, of late silent, I said universal westerns mostly. He worked with Ken Maynard, uh, worked with Tim McCoy. He's in the, I think it's actually one of his last roles. Unfortunately, he died in 1930. He worked in uh, the serial The Indians Are Coming, Tim McCoy. But you see him pop up reasonably regular. But anyway, getting back to Snub Pollard, to give you some background on, on Snub, because again, Snub Pollard was a, a very you know, durable comedian at Howe Roach for, for almost 10 years. He actually, Australian, uh, born in Melbourne, 1889, came uh, to America through the music hall vaudeville route uh, about 1910 as a part of a rather well-known Australian music hall troupe called Pollard's Lilliputians. Now, now that wasn't Pollard as in Snub Pollard. His real name is Harold Frazier. And he worked with Pollard's Lilliputians until the company disbanded around 1915, leaving a number of Australian music hall comics out of work, including uh, another reasonably well-known comedian uh, by the name of Daphne Pollard, who was remembered but basically today for playing uh, some of Laurel and Hardy's nagging wives in pictures like Thicker Than Water and Our Relations. Uh, she 
was not actually related to Snub Pollard, because again, her real name was Daphne Trot Birch. So again, I think they all took the, the Pollard name because Pollard Lilliputians was so well known and you know, gave them, gave them a, a head up. Snub found his way to the movies pretty quickly after, after the company disbanded. Uh, he went to work for SNA. And you can see him in some of Chaplin's early SNA comedies. Most notably, he plays the ice cream man in By the Sea, which was a one-reeler Chaplin kind of knocked off pretty quickly um, when they were you know, had a hole in a release schedule. It's all shot on the beach in a couple of days, but Pollard's very recognizable in that. While Pollard was working at SNA, he um, came to the attention of Hal Roach, who was directing films for SNA and trying to start his own company and Roach and Pollard seemed to hit it off to the point where Roach said when he started the Roland Film Company to produce one reelers for Path A in early 1915 he hired now Harry Pollard who has he changed his name uh, to basically was basically supporting character, but really he was sort of the, the trio of comedians who starred in the Roland fun films, who were, of course, Harold Lloyd and B.B. Daniels, along with Snub. Snub uh, continued to support Harold Lloyd and B.B. Daniels for the next five years, first when Lloyd's playing Lonesome Luke, the sort of chaplain impersonator character, and then uh, continued when Lloyd was... T- created the Glasses character, which he became famous for around 1917. Unfortunately, in night, well, unfortunately for Lloyd, not for, for Snub, um, Harold Lloyd, in 1919, just uh, soon after Roach had moved him to Two Reelers, was seriously injured in an accident where they were shooting some uh, stills, where he was... There were some stills where he was lighting a cigarette with a prop bomb, which they thought was fake, which turned out not to be. The explosion uh, seriously injured Lloyd, laid him up for about a year, forcing Hal Roach to star uh, Snub Pollard, as he was now, the, the nickname he was now known as, in his own series of one reelers, which Snub continued to uh, appear in successfully. I mean, the early 20s. Snub Pollard actually made more pictures for Hal Roach than any other comedian between supporting Harold Lloyd and his own series. He made approximately 300 pictures for Roach. That's more than Harold Lloyd, that's more than Stan Laurel, that's more than any of the other Roach comedians. And Snub's one-reelers were reasonably successful, some of them very memorable, well-remembered even today. Uh, probably his most well-remembered is a picture called It's a Gift, uh, where he's an inventor, and he invents this little kind of toy car, which he which, which he powers by using a big magnet and, and kind of latching on the Model T's going by, and they drag him along. Very well-remembered. Um, in 1922, how Roach moved Snub Pollard to two reelers. At this point, his one reelers and his, then his two reelers were directed by Charles Parrott, who was soon to become director general of How Roach, and then later a comedian for How Roach under the name of Charlie Chase. Uh, these comedies are quite good, but apparently they didn't quite catch fire with audiences. By 1923, Snub was back in One Reelers. He continued in One Reelers with Roach for about a year, and then was, frankly, very unceremoniously dumped, just let go uh, by Roach. Roach had tried to team him with Paul Parrott, who was actually Charles Parrott, or Charlie Chase's brother, in some pictures, but that just didn't seem to work out. And I said, Snub was just handed his walking papers. So after almost 10 years with Hal Roach, Snub found himself out of work. First, he went back to vaudeville, where apparently he met with some success and got together the financing to form Snub Pollard Comedies, which he uh, got a distribution contract with the Rice Brothers. I think they underwrote some amount of the financing and he started making pictures for them in about mid-1926. Unfortunately, his director was James Davis, who actually had a pretty impressive comedy resume. Um, he had 
gotten into pictures first as an actor at Calum around 1914, became a director at Calum in 1915, directing their very popular serial, actually the longest serial of all time. I think it had something like 119 episodes in total called The Hazards of Helen. He started directing about halfway through that, and I think directed them to the end. Then moved, uh, when Calum folded, moved to the Vogue comedies with Ben Turpin in about 1917. Did a few of those, then moved to Universal where he spent the next three or four years directing all the various Universal comedy series produced by the Stern Brothers, LKO comedies, the Century comedies, the Rainbow, the Universal Star comedies. He uh, left Universal in 1919, went to work in uh, directing the Hall Room Boys comedies for producer uh, Harry Cohn, later of Columbia Pictures, but he got uh, his start producing his uh, Hall Room Boys comedies with Sid Smith and Gus Flanagan and a number of other people playing them. Davis directed a lot of those in 1919. Uh, then 1920, he went to work for Max Sennett Unfortunately, did not uh, direct too many pictures there because he was fired for drunkenness, uh, which apparently became sort of an ongoing problem. Uh, Davis drank quite a bit, and it seemed to be getting in the way of his work from kind of this period on. He was at Hal Roach for a while, 1922, directing the Paul Parrott comedies. That may have been where Snow Pollard got to know him. That, again, didn't last. He was let go. He then was directing some of the late Larry Seaman Vitagraph comedies by 1923-24. Um, Seaman left Vitagraph. Davis found himself working for Joe Rock, directing some of the Three Fatties comedies and that sort of thing. Again, he didn't seem to be staying anywhere. Snub hadn't worked with him at Roach, but apparently maybe hired him, you know, maybe knew him from there. And maybe he also was working cheap, which I'm sure was always a prerequisite for a, a Weiss Brother director. So Davis was directing uh, the Snub Pollard comedies, but apparently, uh, again, there were problems, led to overages. And after six comedies, Snub Pollard comedies ran into financial difficulties and disbanded. And Davis went on, uh, he directed a few more Weiss comedies, directed some of the Izzy's and Lizzie's, but, and, and directed a few for a, uh, another low-budget company called Rayhart. But basically, those, that was the end of his directing career. He worked as a gag writer uh, on the Edward Everett Horton comedies. Harold Lloyd was producing at Paramount 27-28. After that, he ends up at Universal writing for Reginald Denny, and then just pretty much drops off the map. We don't hear from him again. But uh, but unfortunately, this seriously hurt Snub Pollard, who, like I said, um, had to disband Snub Pollard comedies after doing the first six, went back to vaudeville, but then again found himself called back a year later to worked for the Weiss Brothers in a second series, which he was teamed with Marvin Loback. But uh, we'll discuss those when we come to them in the, the next pictures. But it, it, it's kind of sad, because these comedies, these six, actually show Snub performing, again, sort of like the Ben Turpins. You, you see, without all of the, the mechanical you know, nature of some of you know, Snub's Roach pictures, without the money to do those kind of mechanical gags, you're seeing a lot more performance here, kind of the same way that you saw Turpin in, you know, working in the Weiss Brothers without all of the wild set of mechanical gags. And Pollard was definitely a capable comic, and as this film and The Bum's Rush, the other one of the snub Pollard comedies uh, from the first series that we're showcasing on this series. Um, I said it's just too bad that he didn't get the opportunity to do more of this because certainly the, the second series was more of a Laurel and Hardy impersonation, uh, although he still gets opportunity to perform there. But uh, we're glad to at least have these ones, thanks uh, to the Weiss brothers, continuing to preserve and reuse them throughout the years. So hope you enjoyed it.